Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for OEC's uh, part two of our fracking webinar series, The Economics of Fracking. Just a few housekeeping notes for us uh, to get started. Um, in our first portion of this, the webinar slides here, we're going to be having about three polling questions, which you'll have the opportunity uh, to respond to just to give us a little bit of information and feedback. Uh, as to what you know coming into this webinar. I know we may have some folks joining us uh, from our, our webinar on shale gas or fracking waste streams uh, two weeks ago. So uh, we may have some folks coming with quite a bit of knowledge and we may have some other folks that are looking to, uh, to get knowledge from today's webinar. So the polling questions will help us with that. You also will find uh, in the chat box a survey a link to a survey uh, that we would love for you to, to help us with, uh, to, to fill out. This provides us with some information just to help with uh, some of our grant reporting that we do here at OEC. We are funded in large part from, from private uh, foundations and donors, and so that survey uh, helps us in giving some feedback to um, one of our grantors. That survey link will also be emailed to you at the end of this webinar. Uh, in terms of questions, we will be holding questions uh, until the end of the presentation, but you are <clears throat> welcome to send questions as we go along, as you think of them through the chat box, and we'll simply hold those until the end of the webinar presentation. And finally, <clears throat> as a follow-up to today's webinar, you will be receiving an email, which will include a recording, uh, a live recording of the entire webinar, and uh, the presentation materials that are associated with today's webinar. All right, so my name is Melanie Houston and I am the Director of Water Policy and Environmental Health at the Ohio Environmental Council. And here at OEC I work on issues related to fracking or shale gas drilling along with other water and environmental health issues. Uh, just so folks are aware from the, from the start at the OEC, we do have an official call for a moratorium on shale gas permitting and drilling. Uh, we made that call back in 2011, but given that uh, drilling and permitting are both moving forward, we also take a two-pronged approach in working to strengthen the laws and regulations on this industry. So I'm very happy that we have with us today two expert speakers. Uh, in the, on the topic of economics and, and specifically today the economics of fracking. At this time I want to go ahead and do, um, introduce them and, and do a short bio for each of them. So first we have Dr. Amanda Weinstein who is a research assistant in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental and Development Economics at The Ohio State University and Amanda recently completed uh, her dissertation there. Her research includes policy briefs about the employment effects of energy policies and general regional growth and policy issues. She is a consultant advising on the economic impacts of alternative energy development on rural communities, and her other research interests include women's role uh, in economic development, examining women's effect on regional productivity growth. She was awarded the Coca-Cola Critical Difference for Women Graduate Studies uh, grant to continue her work on gender issues and economics. And Amanda is also conducting research on, on the skills most valued during a recession. Before starting her PhD at OSU, she was a commissioned officer in the United States Air Force after graduating from the Air Force Academy, and as a scientific analyst in the Air Force, and then a senior management analyst for Bearing Point, she advised Air Force leadership on various acquisition and logistics issues. Amanda will graduate from the Ohio State University in August and join the faculty in the Department of Economics at the University of Akron this fall. We also have with us Amanda Woodrum, who is a researcher for Policy Matters, and her research focuses primarily on energy issues. Amanda has written reports examining the economic impact of Ohio's Advanced Energy Fund and Clean Energy Standards and outline strategies to make our transportation and manufacturing sectors more energy efficient and Ohio's communities more sustainable, all while creating good jobs and building green pathways out of poverty in the process. Amanda also convenes the statewide network, Ohioans for Transportation Choice. 
Before joining Policy Matters, she clerked for the Cleveland Law Department and the Summit County Council, where she received a commendation for commitment to public service. Amanda has a master's degree in economics, a law degree from the University of Akron, and a bachelor's degree from Bowling State University. So some really um, talented and intelligent uh, ladies here with us today, and, and both go by the name Amanda, so we'll try to keep that clear as we go along here. And I'd also like to provide, for some of you who may not be as familiar with our organization, just a little background on the Ohio Environmental Council before we get started with our topic at hand. Uh, we are a statewide environmental advocacy organization with approximately 3,000 individual members and 100 group members across the state. Our work includes legislative work, media outreach, public outreach and education, such as events like this webinar today, and legal action. We also have a law center with three staff attorneys. And while we don't do candidate endorsements, we do lobby and we do take positions on environmental issues, actually quite often. We have 19 staff, which includes uh, staff attorneys, as I mentioned, uh, policy staff, and development and administrative staff. And at this time, I would like to introduce our first polling question, which is asking you, how much do you know about fracking? So sort of in general, what is your level of knowledge on this topic? And I will give a few moments for folks to go ahead and send in their responses so we can take a look at those and have a sense moving forward. Looks like about 75, over 75% 75 of folks have given their responses here and we have um, about 67 saying a moderate amount. Okay, 22% very little, 11% expert understanding. All right, great. Well, I will not spend too much time then um, giving background on hydraulic fracturing. Um, for this next slide, we will go over just some very basics. Many of you have probably seen this image depicting the new combination of horizontal drilling with hydraulic fracturing or the use of sand, water, and chemicals injected at high pressures to blast open shale rock and release the trapped gas. One important piece that I just like to, to note and raise is that oftentimes um, industry folks will argue that this technology has been around for 40 or more years. Um, that's not quite right, not quite the full picture. While the use of hydraulic fracturing to drill vertical wells has been around that long, using the technique of hydraulic fracturing combined with horizontal drilling is very new and only began with the first permitted well in Ohio in 2011. Okay, let's go ahead and introduce our second polling question, find out a little bit more about our audience of folks that's here with us. Um, with this question, I'd like to know what is your attitude toward fracking? So again, a, a bit of a general question here but um, looking to gauge from folks um, where we should be. Should we be engaging in fracking? Should we only be engaging in fracking once we uh, are fully regulated um, and, or once that we know that it's proven to be safe? Or should we not be engaging in fracking at all? Okay, waiting for those responses to come in. And I'm just going to quickly overview <clears throat> some of those responses. It looks like 6% saying that we should engage in fracking. 18% we should engage in fracking only once it's fully regulated. 53% on, on our uh, webinar here today saying we should engage in fracking once it's proven safe. 24% we should not engage in fracking. All right, thanks folks. Really appreciate your sharing your thoughts and attitudes here. And we'll progress forward. Um, with this slide, next slide, I want to just provide very briefly, very generally, because there's really a lot of detail we could go into here that I, that I simply won't, we don't have time to go into today. But for, for a bit of general oversight, or a bit of general information on oversight and regulation and who is doing, which agencies are doing that uh, work here in Ohio. Um, first, we have our Ohio Department of Natural Resources and 
really the big takeaway point is that it's that ODNR that has most of the jurisdiction over the regulation of fracking in our state. Um, some of these, these regulations and oversight include notification and reporting requirements during cementing, also during well completion, stimulation, and well production. Um, site restoration is also required for urban and non-urban area well sites, which is overseen by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And additionally, in terms of water withdrawals, the law currently requires registration. Um, and again, that's, that's not enforcement, um, not to say that there are folks on the ground enforcing this, but that uh, a company or uh, oil gas uh, business would register if a facility has the capacity to withdraw 100,000 gallons uh, per day or more. However, there are some areas where the Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Health uh, has some oversight and uh, some ability also to, to consult and collaborate with Ohio DNR on regulation of this industry. Um, for example, with Ohio EPA, this would include permits um, regarding air, um, uh, air emissions and the regulation of air pollutants. Uh, also, the Ohio EPA oversees um, and regulates uh, impacts to wetlands and waters of the, the state, so streams and tributaries of streams. And with the topic or issue of radioactive uh, radioactivity and radioactive materials uh, coming into Ohio's solid waste landfills, this um, brings into the fold the Ohio Department of Health, um, which um, actually out of a uh, recently passed state budget bill, the Ohio Department of Health, along with Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of Natural Resources, will all have to implement um, a, a set of rules and guidance for disposals of waste from the shale gas industry that include these radioactive materials. All right, we are going to go ahead and introduce our last polling question which is to get a sense and gauge whether we have folks on the webinar today who actually live in an area where fracking is currently happening. And I think this will be of particular interest to our expert speakers that are with us here today. <clears throat> Waiting for those responses to come in. Thank you folks for sharing. All right, we're approaching, all right, over 75% have voted. So we have 29% of folks saying yes, living in areas with, where fracking is currently happening. 53% or over the majority of the folks are not living in areas where fracking is currently happening. And 18% actually aren't sure. All right, so um, just a little note there, follow-up for those folks who aren't sure about whether you're living in areas with fracking. You, um, the, the best kind of starting place to take a look to see would be, well, two places. Ohio Department of Natural Resources has a shale gas activity uh, web page um, where you can go and actually pull up uh, a spreadsheet. Uh, you can see how many wells have been drilled, how many wells have been permitted, and then you can pull up a spreadsheet which lists by county permitted wells. And so you can take a look and see, I know at least by county, and actually I think in there as well uh, would be GPS coordinates that you can put. Um, these are numbers that you'll see, a latitude and longitude. You can actually put into Google Maps and um, really pinpoint exactly where that well is. Second resource for you to see is Frack Tracker. Um, and if you Google Frack Mapping, you should be able to pull up their mapping device and that maps out and, and, and keeps up with ODNR's permitted wells where the different uh, shale gas or fracking wells are in the state of Ohio. So just a couple resources for you. All right, for our next slide, I have about two more slides and then we're going to be handing it over to our expert speakers. Um, and I just want to say that I think a lot of what is going to be included in today's webinar is really addressing what is the true economic story or at least the prediction of, of what's the true economic story of shale gas development in Ohio. While our speakers will go into you know, much more depth here on the studies and literature on this topic, research that they, that they have done, 
I want to start out by highlighting simply kind of two contrasting reports. And the first is an industry study by Klein Heinz, if I'm saying that correctly, and Associates. Uh, in 2011, and this is sort of the, the, the well-known study which predicts this 200,000 uh, job plus jobs figure. And, and this study, I think, really created a lot of hype about the potential for economic output for the state uh, based on shale gas development. The second report by Reuters, which is in 2013 here very recently, uh, stated that, among other things, state employment data academic research, and a week-long tour of factories in Ohio, suggesting that the job figures are a disappointment and actually perhaps not, in fact, what were predicted in that 2011 study uh, by Klein, Heinz, and Associates. And finally, um, just some recent headlines in Ohio's news, <clears throat> newspapers and news sources. We have Utica shell results not as big as expected. Utica shale boom talk not as loud, Columbus Dispatch, Utica shale gas production ramping up slowly, Cleveland Plain Dealer. And um, this is just indicating a hint that uh, Ohio shale boom and positive economic impacts may have been overstated by industry. So let's use these headlines as a starting point to delve into the research and the results of the economic experts that we have with us here today. So with no further ado, I would like to hand the floor and uh, literally the microphone over to Amanda Weinstein uh, to give her presentation to us here today. And then if, when Amanda, when you finish, you'll actually be handing over directly to Amanda Woodrum and then we'll be taking questions at the end. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, as she said, I'm Amanda Weinstein. Uh, the presentation I'll be giving today is called The Economic Value of Shale. It's actually based on a policy paper I did with my advisor, Mark Partridge, at The Ohio State University as part of the SWAIT program in rural urban policy. Okay, give us just a moment. We're having a bit of technical difficulties here trying to bring Amanda Weinstein in. Um, Amanda, um, go ahead and we're going to try to give the microphone back to you again and try to go ahead and get speaking. Hello, this is Amanda. All right. Well, let's try to, while we um, work on troubleshooting that, let's see if we can hand the microphone over to Amanda Woodrum. Okay, Amanda Weinstein. Hello, this is Amanda. Sorry about that. All right, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Uh, okay. Uh, so. The title of my presentation is The Economic Value of Shale in Ohio, and we started, this is based on a policy brief I did with my advisor at The Ohio State University, Mark Partridge, and it's part of the SWING program, Rural Urban Policy. And in one of our meetings, we had this come up as an issue, uh, actually uh, some members of the Farm Bureau brought it up as an issue that would be important to Ohio, uh, that was coming to Ohio, uh, and it was brought to our attention a couple of years ago. And so we started looking into it. Okay, I'm trying to click on this. There it goes. So I'll um, give a brief introduction. We're going to talk about the shale boom in Ohio and what some realistic economic expectations are for Ohio shale development. Uh, then we'll look at the long run and some steps to avoid a bust. So innovations in oil and gas extraction, along with rising oil and gas prices, uh, led to shale development across the U.S., and it opened up shale plays that were previously deemed un, uh, uneconomical. Uh, it, it dramatically reversed trends in the U.S. oil and gas markets as uh, we've been importing oil and gas, and it's been incre uh, steadily increasing, and that has uh, had a big turnaround. Uh, as uh, Melanie mentioned, there's various impact studies uh, have found large employment effects for Pennsylvania, Ohio, and other areas. And in a Columbus Dispatch article, the CEO of one of the companies that do a lot of hydraulic fracturing, Chesapeake Energy, was quoted saying that this will be the biggest thing to the state of Ohio since the plow. Uh, seeing quotes like this in the newspaper and these uh, impact studies, we were concerned that these job numbers may be overinflated by the industry um, as they're 
uh, you know, overinflated by any industry trying to, you know, tout their benefits. Uh, so this can have some pretty big implications for Ohio. Policymakers in the energy industry itself have used these job numbers to justify supporting the industry through tax breaks, favorable regulations, and other measures. Uh, just to give you an example, Pennsylvania actually spent $1.7 billion in subsidies to entice a shell ethane cracker facility to locate in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Uh, an ethane cracker actually converts or cracks ethane, which is one of the products uh, from hydraulic fracturing, into ethylene used to make plastic. Uh, so with an average employment, these facilities usually uh, average about 400 employees, uh, permanent employees, and so that amounts to about $4.1 million, $4 million per job. So to have a meaningful discussion where we weigh all of the costs and we weigh all the benefits of shale, uh, this includes the environmental costs, it's important to have an accurate assessment of the economic benefits to these local communities uh, when they actually do weigh whether or not to go ahead with this. Uh, and I should note, we should be, you know, weighing all of the benefits and all of the costs, not just the job numbers. But I'm going to mainly, <clears throat> excuse me, be talking about uh, the job impacts here. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar of where shale is, I just want to throw this map up of where the shale plays are in the U.S. You can see uh, up where Pennsylvania and Ohio are, the Marcellus Shale there is probably what we're all most familiar with. The Marcellus Shale is the largest shale play in terms of recoverable natural gas. Uh, it has about 55% of the recoverable natural gas in the U.S. Uh, so the Utica is also there. Um, the largest uh, shale plays in terms of oil are actually the Monterey in California uh, and uh, the Bakken up in North Dakota. You'll hear a lot about the Bakken in North Dakota is actually in Wilson, North Dakota, and they're actually experiencing the most pronounced boom throughout the U.S. So just to give a quick closer look, so here is the Marcellus Shale that's there in the pink lines and the Utica Shale in the orange. Uh, the Marcellus Shale has more of the natural gas or sometimes call, called dry gas. The Utica Shale has more of the wet gas. Uh, so the wet gas, when they talk about that, they mean liquids such as ethane, propane, butane, um, used as chemical feedstocks, additives in gasolines uh, uh, for plastics and that sort of thing. Uh, so with low natural gas prices, the Utica Shale is actually a little bit more important to Ohio right now and a little bit more profitable, and we'll see that here. So here are Marcellus Wells, Marcellus Wells in Ohio. So you can see in the top right where the Ohio map is, where these counties are, and then a little closer look at where these wells are. Uh, and this is from uh, ODNR if anybody is interested in where these maps are. And the next slide shows where the Utica wells are, are in Ohio, so you can see significantly more action in terms of where, in terms of Utica wells going into Ohio. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of production for the U.S.? So you can see here, I, uh, the first map I've thrown up is tight oil production. This is not uh, as big a thing in Ohio. You can see the Bakken in North Dakota that I mentioned has had the most pronounced boom with shale development. Um, a lot of development going there. You'll see a lot of news stories about the impact it's had in that area. The next slide will show natural gas production. In the sort of pink color there, you'll, you'll see the Marcellus Shale, uh, which covers Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and other areas. So you can see right around 2005 in both of these slides, we have um, some significant activity in terms of oil and gas production from shale. So along with this boom in production, we have a boom in employment. I've thrown up, you know, the main players uh, in terms of states in the shale development. In this first graph, Ohio kind of acts as a counterfactual. So Ohio didn't actually start drilling, as Melanie mentioned, until about 2012. So we can compare these states to Ohio that had not yet started drilling to see what kind of employment effects they had. Uh, and we can see Pennsylvania there in the green has had some uh, pretty big employment effects in terms of their oil and gas employment. Uh, it's almost doubled in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and this slide is actually uh, baseline at 2005, just so we can compare the states at kind of an uh, even level. So I set their employment at 100 for the year 2005, right around when production began in the U.S. And you'll notice in 2008, there's this drop in production or in employment growth, uh, and you'll see that that is because of prices. So prices in 2008 dropped. Uh, it shows a little bit of how this industry is tied to volatile uh, energy prices, and that can affect 
the uh, economic impacts to these areas. Uh, so I wanted to throw out North Dakota. As I said, it had, on a separate slide, it had the most prominent boom. So you can see uh, that North Dakota, their increase has been uh, up to 600%. Uh, they've gone from about 1,800 oil and gas employees in 2004 to almost 12,000 in 2011. So definitely a huge boom there. So getting into the impact studies. Uh, so Melanie mentioned some of these impact studies already. Uh, the first one I want to talk to you about is uh, the one in Pennsylvania. So Ohio's a little bit lucky in that we didn't start at shale drilling. We're not the first ones to do it. So we can kind of look to other states to see what they did, uh, what they did right, what they did wrong, and sort of do some lessons learned there. And Pennsylvania is actually a great example for Ohio, not only because it's our neighbor, but because it's pretty similar demographically and for some other reasons. So I'm going to talk uh, a bit about Pennsylvania because we can really look to Pennsylvania to see what we can expect here in Ohio. So this first study, uh, this Constantine report, found that there would be there were 140,000 jobs supported or created uh, in 2010 in Pennsylvania. So the total direct natural gas extraction employment jobs was just under 26,000 uh, people in 2010. This is after they uh, added approximately 5,000 that year. Uh, so this, if we look at their total employment, they added about a total of 20,000 oil and gas jobs uh, in the entire thing, which, uh, uh, oops, this implied multiplier is, that should say uh, seven, closer to seven or eight. So the implied multiplier is about seven or eight. So economists often look at this sort of multiplier effect. And what that means is every time you add an oil and gas job, we want to know how many additional do jobs do you create. And that could be in restaurants and bars and hotels, that type of thing. We want to know what's that economic multiplier. So the economic multiplier here, this should say uh, about 7 or 8, not 28, uh, is about 7, 7 or 8 here in this study. And when we compare this to the literature, economists generally find that multipliers for this sector really are closer to 2, and that's being even pretty generous. Um, so when we look to North Dakota to compare you know, this finding, North Dakota gained uh, 110,000 non-farm jobs in the 10-year period from 2003 to 2013. In that same time period, they gained 21,000 mining employment jobs. So this implies a multiplier. Even if all 110,000 jobs were directly or indirectly from shale development, which is highly unlikely, it still implies an economic, economic multiplier of 5.2. Uh, so what that shows us is North Dakota, the with most pronounced boom, had a multiplier a maximum of no higher than five. And with the Constantine report, they found an economic multiplier of about seven or eight. So it shows you that this is clearly an overestimate. So there's also calls that while unemployment will change dramatically in these areas, uh, sorry, you might hear my dogs barking occasionally. Uh, so unemployment in North Dakota, again, this is the area with the most pronounced boom and the most kind of action in shale development. Unemployment barely changed from 3.6% in 2003 to 3.2% in 2013. You'll often see the media say, well, look at North Dakota's unemployment. It's so low because of shale development. It's low because it's always been low. North Dakota has always had low unemployment rates. Uh, finally, mining is just a small share of North Dakota's economy at 6%. So we really shouldn't expect this sector to have a large impact on North Dakota's total economy uh, because it's such a small share. So what does this mean for Ohio? So based on this Constantine report is actually how the Klein Henson and Associates got their estimate of 200,000. So they used some of the similar methodology. They consulted with Constantine. They used some of his assumptions, uh, similar um, uh, kind of double counting and that type of thing. And that's how they came up with that 200,000 uh, jobs in Ohio. So what we did in our report is we were looking at using actual NASA and gas actual natural gas extraction data from Pennsylvania. So how many employees were there actually in directly in the natural gas extraction industry? Uh, and then we applied the multiplier of two. So we'll, again, the multiplier of two uh, is a little generous, but it's pretty close to what we think is accurate. And we find the, <clears throat> the employment impact should be closer to 20,000. Uh, so just to give you, again, about this multiplier, a uh, study from Kelsey found the multiplier actually might be closer to 1.86, somewhere between 1.86 and 1.9. Uh, in a study that I have coming out in a journal, I found that the multiplier for the U.S. is actually closer to 1.3. 1 so 2 is a 
pretty generous multiplier for the literature. Uh, so once we came out with this estimate of 20,000, uh, the Ohio Shale Coalition came back and said, okay, okay, 200,000 jobs is a little bit much. Uh, how about 65,000? So they're kind of treating it as more a, a negotiation than actual, you know, getting these, what these ec economic expectations really are. Um, so I won't go too much into the details of, you know, why this difference is, but I think it's important just to have an overview of why do we find such different numbers? Why do we find 10% of the impact of the Klein-Hen study? So first off, these impact studies that have uh, been done, they estimate direct and indirect effects, and they're often overestimates of new job creation. And serious regional economists haven't viewed them as best, best practice for decades. At best, a well-done impact study lets they have all of the right assumptions. They're not doing anything incorrectly. They're using the software appropriately. The best that you can do, even done well, they tell you how many jobs are supported by an industry. They don't tell you how many jobs it creates. And if you look closely at these reports, they do say that, but when media picks up these, uh, these reports, they don't know exactly what these impact studies are doing. They are not giving you jobs created. They are giving you jobs supported. That's at best. At worst, the economic effects can be double counted, uh, which has happened in those studies that I just mentioned, and they apply unrealistic assumptions to the model to increase these estimates. So they also don't account for displacement effects and negative effects of drilling. They kind of are you know, adding up all these positives, sometimes double counting and so on, and without looking at any of the negative effects it has on other industries. And generally it relies on a computer model, usually um, there's various ones out there that they use, but it relies on a com computer model. It does not rely on actual employment data, um, which we prefer to rely on the actual employment uh, data. So we'd rather look at what the industry has actually done rather than what the industry says they will do. Uh, and the bottom line is it's not a counterfactual. So a counterfactual finds what would have happened in these areas had there been no drilling at all. And let's compare that to what actually happened. And these impact studies just can't do that. Uh, so a lot of the times the argument we get is, okay, so even if the employment effects are smaller than, you know, we initially expected for Ohio and for Pennsylvania, they could have a big impact on very small uh, counties that are rural and remote. So what we did is we matched uh, drilling counties and similar non-drilling counties in Pennsylvania, and this creates that counterfactual I was talking about, uh, to see, okay, let's see what these impacts are within these small counties. And we find modest and sometimes even insignificant uh, employment effects in Pennsylvania. Uh, we do find significant earnings impact. And that is due largely to leasing payments, royalty payments. It's also doing to uh, bid up wages in these areas. Uh, so we also do statistical regressions. Uh, and if you want uh, more information on this, you can go to our paper on the Swank Programs website. Uh, I didn't want to throw up any you know, boring economic equations or anything up here. Uh, so when we do these statistical regressions on these counties, we get the same result. We show employment impacts are modest at best, uh, and the earnings impacts are about double the employment impacts, uh, but that these impacts do decrease over time. Uh, so a recent journal article uh, by Jeremy Weber finds that he actually does not, he looks at Texas, he looks at counties within Texas, Colorado, and Wyoming, and he finds that for every $1 million in shale gas production results in about 2.35 jobs within these counties. Uh, so overall, uh, serious academic literature finds that these employment effects are actually pretty modest. Uh, and this is actually not surprising. This is what we would have expected before even looking at the data. And these reasons are that this industry is very capital intensive, much more capital intensive than labor intensive. So each unit of output uh, requires more capital than it does labor. You see, you know, huge drilling rigs and all this machinery and trucks and that type of thing. You don't see tons of people make, you know, that go into this. So that's one reason why these employment impa impa impacts are pretty modest. Another that I've started to mention are displacement effects. So there's going to be displacement effects on the coal industry as we're producing more our natural gas, that means we'll need less coal. Um, it doesn't mean that we're just going to suddenly start using more natural gas. It's going to be replacing some things, and the, one of the things it's going to be replacing, especially natural gas, is coal. Uh, it could also have some negative effects on other industries like tourism. 
Uh, and there's actually a phenomenon in economics called Dutch disease, uh, which is basically it can you know, displace other economic, economic activity, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so really kind of the bottom line is that even with really impressive growth rates, uh, you know, which it has had in many areas, the energy sector is just a small share of the total Ohio economy at 5.34 million. Uh, in 2013, that share is only 0.3 percent. We just can't, you know, rest all of Ohio's economy on such a small sector. Uh, and there's also some leakages. I won't talk too much on this, but uh, especially initially, most of the employment doesn't actually go to residents, it goes to non-residents. Uh, and then that, that figure kind of will improve over time as local residents get skilled and uh, can be caught up on, you know, and get jobs in this area. But initially, a lot of the jobs don't go to residents. Uh, there's also leakage in that royalty and leasing money there are, and absentee landowners. So you can have a landowner that's never lived in Pennsylvania, but they're getting uh, the money from that and they're using it in other states. So there's also leakage in land holdings. So this is from 2012. It shows land uh, holdings and acres for Ohio and the company that holds those lands and where their headquarters are. You'll notice none of those headquarters are in Ohio. A lot are in Oklahoma and Texas. Um, so you're going to see some employment benefits there at the headquarters and you're also going to see the profits go there. So I want to talk a little bit more about displacement effects. Uh, so displacement effects, uh, basically what we're talking about is the shale uh, development industry is displacing other economic activity that would have happened otherwise. Um, and that reduces the employment effects that this industry can have. So I talked about it can affect the coal industry. Uh, it can also affect tourism. So if it is negatively affecting environmental amenities, tourism uh, benefits will go down, less people uh, will want to, you know, go on fishing tours and that type of thing. If there's any concern over water or that type of thing, people don't necessarily want to go camping next to a drilling rig. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. Uh, there's also an important impact that happens from the bidding up of wages. This industry uh, is relatively well paid and they have well paid jobs. Um, we generally think of higher wages as a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a good thing for industries that rely on low wages. So it can displace industries that rely on low wages. Uh, and this could be manufacturing. So if manufacturing is relying on hiring people um, you know, with low wages and the wages are being bid up in that area, they're not going to be able to hire as many people. Uh, so here's a sign. This is actually uh, in front of a Taco John's in North Dakota uh, because they had such a hard time hiring people. Uh, they were offering, you, know, you can see there on the sign, $15 an hour to work at uh, Taco John's. Uh, and this is from a CNN Money report, and it talks a little bit about the effects that are going on uh, in, North, in North Dakota and some of these other areas. Um, but basically, among the inconveniences they have uh, the, associated with a shale boom, they have a higher cost of living. So even though they might be having these higher wages, the higher cost of living may offset that, and they may not be better off at all. They have more traffic, and there's higher turnover rates among businesses uh, that lose employees to these oil fields. Uh, and there's also a housing shortage, especially in North Dakota and some of these really small uh, rural and remote areas. In the long run, so we've kind of, I've kind of been looking at the short run so far. Uh, and the problem with a lot of these impact studies and a lot of uh, the research on this is it's really just a short run look. And, you know, we also need to be looking at in the long run. So in the long run, economists have about 150 years of evidence of natural resource booms, and the evidence is often negative. A number of studies have shown this is true for countries, uh, that they're actually hindered and not helped by their resource abundance in terms of economic growth. It actually has a name. We call this the natural resource curse. Uh, and it's also been shown for U.S. states and U.S. counties uh, my advisor, Mark, Mark Partridge, actually did some of the research that showed that. Uh, so this natural resource curse has a number of causes um, or that you know, we believe to be the causes. One of them we talked about are volatile energy prices. So these vol the volatility in energy prices can lead to these booms and busts, and that can lead to a, a volatile kind of economy for these local areas. It can be uh, very dangerous for them in the long run. We already talked a little about Dutch disease, crowding out other economic activity. That has some long-run implications. 
uh, and also the institution. So here I mean mostly government institutions. So especially in the country setting, it can lead to some kind of corruption and this rent seeking. Uh, it can also lead to overspending in a county. So suddenly a county has all of this money to spend and they get used to this higher level of spending. Uh, and then suddenly when you hit a bust or when it goes away, it's hard to, it's easier to start spending rather than just to draw back that spending. So it's kind of like this curse of the lottery idea. And I mentioned a little bit about these uh, relatively high paid jobs and they're relatively well paid jobs that uh, require relatively lower levels of skill. And this has a problem in the long run for incentivizing people to invest in human capital. Well, by that I mean uh, different skills, education, and, and that type of thing. Uh, and that can have some uh, pretty bad effects in the long run. Uh, generally, you know, there's a host of research in economics that finds uh, higher levels of human capital in the area, higher levels of schooling, education, that type of thing really helps an area out. Uh, so if these higher wages and relatively low skilled you know, jobs are incentivizing people not to invest in education and not to invest in their skills, then this has some serious long-term implications that are negative. Uh, so I wanted to throw this slide up there. So this is looking at employment growth from about 1969 uh, to this one I think is actually to 2009. And it shows this boom that happened. Like I said, this is not the first boom the U.S. has had. It probably won't be the last boom. Uh, so in the 1970s uh, and 80s, we had an oil boom and an oil bust. So here you can clearly see the oil boom that happened and the subsequent oil bust. Uh, so if you look at the gray line there, that's Williams County, North Dakota, where Williston is. It's where their shale development is really centered, where they're having the largest boom. And we can see that they had the boom in right in right around the late 70s, early 80s. And then they had the bust. The bust is what we're concerned in, about. We're in the boom right now and things are looking pretty good. Uh, the bust could really hurt an area. And previous research shows that the bust can actually be worse than the boom was good. So if you look at that gray line there, the black line is the US, just to give you kind of a baseline comparison. And the gray line is uh, in North Dakota. So after that bust hit, their employment growth, uh, they did more poorly than the rest of the U.S. for a long time and they actually didn't even uh, catch up at all until the shale boom happened. So there's some pretty uh, significant impacts in the long run for these areas. Uh, so steps to avoid the bust. So you may have noticed that there are areas that have seemed to avoid the bust uh, and those areas are some areas in Texas. They seem to uh, uh, do pretty well. There's some areas in Canada and Alberta. Uh, that do pretty well. And a lot of those reasons are they have taken steps, uh, specific steps, to try and avoid some of these long-run impacts. So basically we shouldn't rely on the short-term benefits in employment and earnings. We should address the short-term and long-term costs to communities. So to make sure that we benefit the most from any employment or earnings effects we get, uh, we really need to try and mitigate the costs and the causes of this natural resource curse I was talking about. Uh, so I'll just go over this kind of quickly. So we need to make sure that we're investing things like maintaining infrastructure, public services, uh, investing in our environmental amenities to counteract what's being done, but also to improve on it. Uh, we need to be uh, replacing the permanent loss of this physical capital by investing in human capital. Uh, so basically this natural gas is a physical capital that this area has. And when we extract it from the ground, they're never going to get that back. So they're losing something in the long run permanently by doing this. So we need to be giving something back. And the best thing, one of the best things we can do is be investing in human capital. And that also counteracts those incentives of these high paid jobs that are relatively low skilled. Uh, but this also means to cover all of these costs, all of these short, uh, short term costs, long term costs, we need to be setting our taxes appropriately to be able to cover these costs. Uh, so just to give you a quick example here, so here's uh, where severance taxes, uh, I think this is actually from, uh, uh, so here you can see Ohio, and if we even compare Ohio to Texas, uh, so Texas is where, you know, you have Dallas and Houston that have done pretty well, Ohio severance taxes for oil are much lower, uh, oil less important here than natural gas, so here's the effective natural, tax, natural gas tax burden, you can see Ohio way there at the top, and Texas uh, way down there towards the bottom. Uh, so even if we were online in taxes in terms of Texas, we'd be doing much better in terms of making sure that we can cover the costs uh, 
of shale development. Uh, so the real question of shale investment, I mentioned this in the beginning, should not be job creation. Um, it's hard as we're coming out of as we're coming out of the Great Recession not to focus on job creation, but that's not the best way to value whether or not we should go ahead with something. The best way to value that is a benefit cost analysis. We should look at all of the benefits of shale and we should compare them to all of the costs of shale in the short term and the long term, and this includes the environmental costs. Uh, so having an accurate estimate of the economic benefits of shale development allows us to better a better way to weight all of the benefits and all of the costs and to start that process. Uh, so in this question for the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, natural gas should be compared to coal. So you can't just weigh all of the benefits and costs in a vacuum. So you, this needs to be part of a larger conversation on energy and where energy is going to come from. And we need to compare it to its alternative. For natural gas, its most likely alternative is coal. Um, if we're looking at you know, oil and that type of thing, then it's probably oil from overseas and that type of thing. So we really need to be including this in part of a larger dialogue about our energy policy in this country. Uh, so Ohio, I mentioned a little bit, should consider higher severance taxes. Kasich has talked a, um, a bit about this uh, to make sure that we can counteract the short-term and long-term costs and kind of get the best benefit we possibly can from this uh, as we're moving forward. Um, and this includes investing in schools, infrastructure, the environment, uh, making sure that we have the right regulations, uh, and so on. And I will end it there. Great. We're going to transition. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, we're going to transition to Amanda Woodrum with Policy Matters. Go ahead, Amanda. Hi. You can just call me. You can just call me Amanda Number Two. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Amanda. With policy matters. Okay, great. So I am Amanda Woodrum from Policy Matters Ohio. Um, we're a progressive economic think tank. And um, as Melanie said earlier, I focus largely on energy and sustainable development. Uh, this is my first foray into fracking. I can figure out how to use this. There we go. Okay, so um, this fracking project is a that I'm working on now is a multi-state um, research collaborative with organizations similar to Policy Matters um, in Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, we also have an advisory group of academic experts, uh, academics and experts. Um, and the goal here is really to get a, a sort of a regional perspective on the impact of um, fracking in the region. So as Amanda, number one, kind of alluded to, um, it's not, you can't just talk about um, the jobs or uh, just talk about the environmental impact. The story is really bigger. Um, and to get um, an ec a true economic assessment, you need to think about both costs and benefits. Um, with the bottom line coming down to, uh, there's a certain, once you look at both costs and benefits, there'll be a, a net benefit or possibly even a net cost of, of industry development. Um, and in the case of the oil and gas industry, um, how that net benefit looks really will largely be determined by um, the number of jobs created, but also who gets them. Are they temporary? Or are they permanent? Um, what's the local economic activity? Um, how many of those dollars stay in the community? Um, royalties, but also the local share of them versus what's going to other states. Um, 
and then of course the cost to the community um, and as Amanda number one alluded to both in the short run in the long term um, this our work this project is, is focusing mostly on the short run um, as sort of a start uh, to get some of those um, identify some of those benefits and costs um, so we we haven't yet looked at um, things like uh, the risk of a change in water quality and, and that long-term impact um, on both biodiversity or, or health uh, of humans or the economy. Um, so that needs to be done and it's important, but we have to start somewhere and we're starting with the short run. So the project goals here are number one to develop um, some factual information, um, not just among the benefits, but also the, the social um, and fiscal impacts of nat natural gas drilling um, in order to really improve understanding about uh, these social impacts. And the reason we're doing this, or at least the outcome we're hoping to get from it is to provide information to local officials to help them anticipate issues, plan for them, and uh, minimize some of the, the negative impacts. Um, and also we want to help improve the, capac the capacity for local folks to be able to factor in the actual costs into their decision making process. So phase one of this project has been uh, we started looking at research that's already been done in other areas and regions where um, the industry is, is farther along. Ohio is sort of behind some of the other folks. Um, and that kind of gave us insight into what to be looking for uh, in our own region. And um, the next phase, which has started, um, is a series of case studies, which will be in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And I've been um, focused on the Ohio case study and particularly uh, the Carroll County region, uh, which is by far the most active county in Ohio um, for the fracking industry. Um, so I'm sort of I'm starting to wrap that up. I did a series of interviews there, um, and I'm digging into some data. Um, then we'll publish uh, the outcome of the case studies. Um, the next phase will be bringing together from folks from these local communities in the different regions uh, that we're studying to talk about um, issues and uh, best practices that they've come up with um, and also to make some um, recommendations policy-wise. So one of the things I want to start with is um, when you know as I get into the impacts of or the the understandings or the issues we've seen um, as we've been doing this research is the economic setting where which um, the industry development is taking place because I think it's really important to understand that. So. Um, as you probably know, fracking is occurring largely in rural communities. Um, and th many of these communities have been struggling economically for decades. Um, young people are leaving, their population is stagnate, stagnating. Um, they were particularly hard hit by the recession. Um, and it, it felt like um, it is one person, one of the commissioners I met with, that um, that they Carroll County in particular, Carrollton, was on its way to becoming a ghost town. Um, so these so these communities are struggling, and for them, fracking has been a real shot in the arm. And that's also an, an, a quote from one of the interviews that I got. So having said that, um, let's start and get into. Um, some of the benefit cost analysis um, that I've been working on. And again, these are just sort of early preliminary results. Still, we're still digging more. Uh, so on the benefit side, um, well, 
let's first start with mineral rights because that's really the first stage of, of industry development in an area. Um, one of the first things uh, folks notice uh, is that that they know something is going on is really uh, all these landsmen show up uh, as they call them. And these folks are are negotiating leases for for the mineral rights um, of these properties. Um, this is a big uh, piece, an important part of, of valuing um, the economic impact. And some of these leases now um, in in the Carroll County region are going for as high as uh, a signing bonus of six thousand dollars an acre plus twenty percent royalties, which is which is a pretty um, pretty good amount. But it, I should also say that on the flip side of that, um, you know, well, on one side you have you you are hearing stories of, of new millionaires. Um, but the flip side of that is that um, not everyone got that good of a deal. Uh, a lot of folks signed early. Some folks are even um, stuck in 100-year-old leases. Um, and the folks that signed on earlier, um, they really didn't have a, a feel for what was truly happening and what kind of deal they could get. They needed the money, um, so, so they signed on. Um, and some of these bads are uh, some of these deals are looked now as bad deals, um, and and there are lawsuits um, happening. Um, but uh, some of the reaction has been they should have got a they should have got a better lawyer. Um, although from some of the local interviews I've heard, really even if they had or could afford one, a lot of the local lawyers didn't necessarily. Um, know this kind of law in and out and wouldn't necessarily have been able to protect um, those rights. So um, another positive though is that um, a lot of these signing bonuses that folks are getting, um, they're spending locally. Um, and that's generating local economic, economic activity. Uh, and one of the big things um, that these signing bonuses are being used for is, is farming equipment. Farmers are modernizing their farm, investing. Um, and so that's turning in uh, a multiplier effect um, from the signing bonus uh, into an investment. So that's a positive. Um, some of the, a lot of the local government lands are also being leased. Um, for instance, uh, the school district is leasing some of their lands. They've been hard hit um, by local government cuts. Um, the school district, and, as well as the uh, county government, and, um, so they this these signing bonuses have sort of provided uh, uh, funding to cover the gap um, that they were experiencing. Um, Another sort of on the bad side is that um, in addition to some of these bad deals, some folks are actually being forced into signing over their mineral rights. And this is called mandatory pooling. Um, and not only um, are they being pressured by the landmen, um, they're also being pressured by their neighbors who fear that if um, these folks don't sign that um, the neighbors will lose their own deal, and they don't want that to happen. Um, so it creates some tension in the community. Um, on, on the last thing I'll say about mineral rights is that um, while folks have, have gotten these signing bonuses and they've spent the funds, um, and that's generated um, some buzz and local economic activity, they haven't really yet received much in the way of royalties. Um, and it's hard to predict, at least at this point, what those royalties are going to be. Um, in some cases, it appears uh, where, where fracking is a little far along, these particular wells taper off pretty quickly. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on uh, as far as positive economic impact. 
So another piece of it um, is, as I've already sort of alluded to, is local economic activity. Um, in addition to the spending created by these signing bonuses, um, the oil and gas industry folks have made a, a good, solid attempt to buy local. So they're, they're buying trucks, they're buying equipment, they're buying gear um, from like the local hardware store, um, and that's been a boon to local businesses. The hotels are full, restaurants are busy, gas stations are selling a lot of gas. Um, and as I mentioned before with the signing bonus, um, the farmers or local folks are making repairs. But it, it also means all this activity uh, on a positive side is that there's uh, an increase in local tax revenues uh, from sales tax um, and also gas tax. And you go into Carroll County or Carrollton, one of the first things you'll see is there's the renovating a poorhouse. There's a, uh, it's been in need for a long time. There's lots of these kinds of projects um, that they just haven't had the money for, uh, and they're able to undergo projects now. And one thing I want to point out, which I think I meant to earlier but didn't, um, is that with these investments in the farms, um, another sort of long-term impact implication um, that I don't think has gotten much notice is that farming and drilling, on at least on some level, fit together. Um, you know, if it if it proves that water quality becomes an issue, maybe it's not won't be the case. But at least in the short run, um, drilling pro will provide funds for the farmer to be on a farm. It takes up just a little bit of the acreage, maybe five acres for a drilling pad, the rest of it can still be farmed. So they fit nicely together, um, at least thus far. And one of the good things that comes out of that is it can deter urban sprawl. Um, because there's economic, greater economic value for the land, it won't necessarily um, the, the owners won't need to feel the need to sell off to, you know, another Walmart or that sort of thing. Um, so that's a positive environmental impact. Um, on the negative side, uh, as Amanda alluded to already, um, you know, a lot of these companies are out-of-state companies, or all of them actually, at least the oil and gas industry, um, so they're taking their profits out of the state. Uh, and there really is no value-added kind of facility within the community, um, in part because there's, uh, in these rural communities, and it's particularly true in Carroll County, there's really limited water and sewer infrastructure, um, and that limits, limits development because um, business don't have, have access to, to these really important pieces of infrastructure. Uh, but it also comes to another long-term question is, do they invest in water and sewer infrastructure and expand it? Um, it's hard to, and I've, I've found that with the interviews with, the, with local folks, they're pretty hesitant to do that um, because they don't know, um, and it kind of goes back to what Amanda was talking about, boom and bust, they don't know what's really going to happen, how long it's going to be around, and there, there's real pr pragmatism about, you know, if they spend this money now and the, and, uh, the industry vacates, then the locals will be stuck with these increased costs. So there's reluctance to, to expand the infrastructure. But there's also pres uh, pressure to do so because they're losing opportunities um, to develop some of these value-added facilities. Um, and what I mean by that is the processing of, of the natural gas or the oil, which adds value to it. Um, at this point, it's largely being trucked off somewhere else um, for somebody else, which is another issue um, on the long-term value. You hear a lot about we have our own 
uh, homegrown energy, which is really important because we spend a lot of money in Ohio um, importing energy from elsewhere. Um, and we use more coal uh, than we actually produce. We use uh, natural gas um, use more than we um, uh, than we actually produce, at least at this point. Uh, so, and then of course oil, 98 percent of which is imported. So there's a huge so that as a real result, a, a huge chunk, about 10 percent of our our total economy um, is spent on energy, most of which leaves the state uh, that money. Um, so there's a huge economic value. Um, from producing our own energy, whether it's renewable energy um, or, or natural gas. Um, the problem is nobody's really preparing to use this gas locally. There's mostly talk about shipping it to somewhere else so that it can sort of enter the, um, the bigger economy. Um, and that means probably the prices won't stay, for at least for local use, um, won't stay low. It'll be part of a global um, energy uh, economy that sets the price, um, and it it reduces some of the benefits from having that homegrown energy. Uh, another cost, of course, is fracking wastewater, and this is largely an external cost to other communities. The the wastewater is not being um, uh, gotten rid of within the community, it's it's going somewhere else, and that community then bears the brunt of that cost. Um, and then there's also housing crunch, uh, road and traffic impacts, which I'm going to get into more detail on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to predict um, what's going to happen, which makes it extremely hard to, to plan for. So those are some of the negatives that, um, and then one thing I'm going to distinguish: there's there's negatives for the subtract from the total benefits, and then there's and then there's costs, actual costs. And now I'm going to sort of get really more into the costs. Well, actually, nope. Let's talk about jobs. Um, so we know the oil and gas industry creates jobs, as Amanda talked about. One thing. Um, it's important about these jobs is they do pay good wages. Um, and of course, there are questions about the number of jobs that will actually be created. Uh, but one thing that we don't hear that much about is that most of these jobs are actually not going to local workers. They're, um, they're going to folks from Oklahoma and Texas who, who actually follow the industry. They follow these drilling pads. Uh, so we, we hear a lot about these particular oil and gas industry jobs being created, but not so much about, well, they're not actually going to go to local workers. So, so that's a negative of those benefits that subtracts from that value of those jobs created, at least uh, as far as Ohio is concerned, the value to Ohio. Um, they're also largely temporary in nature, and they're not permanent. Uh, which goes to the boom bust issue. So uh, they move they move along rapidly, uh, and worker safety is also an issue. There, these are really hard jobs. There's injuries and occasionally even some fatalities. Most of the jobs at the local level has have actually been in these supportive industries. We're talking about jobs, truck driving, um, cleaning, restaurant jobs, mechanics, um, and one of the new ones I, I heard recently about is actually concierge services. Um, these, as I mentioned, the, the oil and gas workers work long, hard hours. They're really tough jobs. Um, they work uh, long, uh, two weeks on, one week off. They'll leave during the week off. Um, and they don't have a lot of time during, during their weeks on to do things like cleaning, laundry, um, cooking. Uh, so there's a, uh, it, at least in Carrollton, there's a growing sort of need for what they're calling concierge services to do this sort of 
sort of work. Um, but these kinds of jobs, these supportive jobs, they don't pay nearly as well as the oil and gas industry jobs. Um, so that subtracts from the benefits. But overall, to, as far as um, the locals are concerned, they're pretty resigned not, not to not having the oil and gas industry jobs. Um, they're pretty happy with at least having these uh, local support jobs. Um, another potential or cost uh, is that some of these workers, mo mo not most of them, most of the workers come alone, but some of the workers bring families um, and they enroll their children in, in school temporarily. And at, as a result, there's some increased need for, for uh, staffing. Um, and ESL, or English as a Second Language Instruction. Not necessarily a bad thing, but just saying that there, there's a cost. So related studies, um, as Amanda already pointed out, um, her and her co-author uh, say, well, not so much 200,000 jobs, but probably more like 20,000 jobs. Um, but even there, I want to mention that those jobs are not necessarily going to Ohio workers. Um, but there's undoubtedly economic activity happening um, in the shale gas region, particularly Carroll County. Um, one thing that's interesting is a study that was done um, showing that the sales tax has, in Carroll County has, de has increased um, the uh, the worker the number of workers have have not necessarily done so and that's sort of in, indicative of uh, the fact that there are workers coming in from out of state and spending money um, but they're not necessarily uh, local workers um, and another study that sort of came to this point, it's, it's really hard to get data to, to show the difference between local workers and out-of-state workers, but one of the ways to look at it is um, income tax, right? because local workers will file their income taxes, um, are more likely to file in Ohio versus out-of-state workers will probably file, most likely to file in the state that, from where they come, and that's one way to get a, a handle on how much income is actually going to local residents. And one study in PA found that, um, you know, relatively small amount of income, um, at least in 2011, um, increases. And that's something that we'll keep, keep our eye on. Um, and the last thing I want to say, it is entirely possible um, that costs could outweigh benefits when you weigh them all. Um, I think my instinct is at this point that that is not the case in Ohio, at least as far as weighing short-term costs and benefits, um, because uh, Ohio being a little less rural than some of the other places like in North Dakota is able to better absorb some of the costs. We've also engaged in some practices um, that help reduce costs, um, which is a good thing, or minimize costs. So let's, I'm, I'm going to start moving a little faster. I think I've, I feel like I've been talking forever. Um, so let's talk about the housing market. Um, there's all these out-of-state workers coming in. Um, they need a place to stay. Uh, so there's uh, a strong rental market happening and increases in rental income for folks that own rental properties. Um, one of the folks I interviewed was a realty, a local realty agency, and they've actually brought in a, a rental agent because they've had so, so much interest in, in rental units. Um, there's also a market for secondhand furniture developing because, um, as I mentioned, these, these workers come in, they don't have a lot of time, they, uh, they don't want to mess around with buying furniture or uh, pots and pans and that sort of thing, and they're not going to be around for long. Um, so they, they want these uh, rental units coming fully furnished and equipped with 
um, uh, things like pots and pans. Um, so there's a secondhand market now, or a market for secondhand furniture developing. Uh, also, investment properties are going quickly, so if there's any opportunity to rent out um, properties, that they're being bought. Um, and one of the uh, good, one of the great things about this is because there's been so little um, economic activity in the community to date, um, or for a long time they've been struggling, uh, a lot of these rural communities haven't been able to um, rehab some of their properties for a long time. And, and there's a lot of uh, rural um, homes that are in, or have been in the past in, in troubled condition. Um, and in these communities, we're seeing a lot of rehab happening to gear up for the rental market, um, which is a good thing. Um, on the negative side um, of that is that rental prices are increasing, and the locals are not making the kind of wages that um, the oil and gas industry workers are making. So they're having trouble actually affording um, the increase in prices. Um, they also fear evic eviction from their current properties. As soon as their lease is up, they, they're worried that um, the landlord wanting to get some of these higher rents might kick them out. Um, and, and I did hear stories of that happening. Um, no data, just, just stories. Um, and when folks uh, are looking for a place, um, some advice I've heard is that they really shouldn't move if they can't help it um, because they will end up uh, in lower quality housing. And we're talking about rents going from 400 to as high as 1300 a month. It's um, not a direct comparison because, again, these are fully furnished uh, apartments and whatnot. Um, but too high for, for local folks. Um, and what is in that range um, now is really only mobile homes or moving to some other community. Um, there's also a cloud over residential properties that are near drilling. In the most part, uh, the drilling leases are being separated from um, the regular um, property um, legal documents uh, and they're being so they can be sold separately if they do that um, and you can look start to look at the value um, and of course the mineral rights have increased in value um, but the properties near drilling the actual physical property um, you know there's pressure at least um, to hurt those property values Uh, related studies sort of finding the same thing in, in other areas um, in Wyoming. Um, they found uh, a, a boost in housing prices or rental prices and a shortage of housing, uh, not, unlike, uh, not unlike we're seeing in, in Carroll County. Um, another study uh, found, and I think Amanda alluded to this earlier, that it makes it um, difficult for local employers to actually recruit workers. Um, you know, they can't keep up in the wages um, the, and the co uh, resulting cost of, of living from the rise in housing costs um, so it makes it difficult to get folks to move uh, in the community and take those jobs. Uh, and let's see, um, two studies found uh, value of homes negatively impacted. Biggest cost uh, is really roads, um, road impacts from increased traffic and particularly heavy and overweight trucks. Um, causes increased wear and tear on the roads. Um, there's also increase in related accidents um, and that further causes wear and tear, um, damage to roads, guardrails, and signage. One of those best practices um, that I mentioned earlier uh, that Ohio has is the road use and maintenance agreements, which are used to identify travel routes and address some of the costs. Uh, 
in one example, um, Chesapeake, uh, one of the major investors in Carroll County, they contribute a million dollars towards road widening and resurfacing projects in Carroll County. So that help, helps out offset some of the costs. Other issues we have not that have been seen in, in other areas, but not so far uh, in Ohio, um, crime increases and uh, increases in uncompensated health care um, from folks that don't have health insurance, um, some of those out-of-state workers. And um, I won't spend too long on that. So I'm wrapping up, finally. Uh, I feel like I went on too long. Um, but phase, so phase two, um, we're, we're coming around the corner on, hope, hope to have something published in the next month or so. Uh, and then phase three will be bringing people together to talk about best practices. And that'll be sometime this fall. And that's my contact information if you need it. Great. Thank you, Amanda Weinstein and Amanda Woodrum, for those excellent presentations. And um, really great to learn about your research and your review of the literature. Hopefully it was um, <clears throat> enlightening to folks that are on the webinar with us. We still have a great list of folks. We haven't lost too many participants as we've gone along here. We already have some questions um, that have come in in the chat box. Please feel free to continue to um, send those in to us. Uh, I'm going to start um, going through the first couple. And I think what we're going to do is unmute all of the uh, speakers, uh, other panelists, both Amanda's, so that um, after I read the question, you can feel free to chime in um, to respond uh, to those questions. So the first question we have. Um, uh, this is not necessarily directly related to our, our webinar here today, So, um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Is ODNR pressured to support uh, fracking and um, can sort of give <laughs> the panelists an opportunity to, you're welcome to, um, to field or decline that question. It um, doesn't pertain specifically, I think, to our um, economic kind of presentations today, but um, yeah, again, the question is, is ODNR pressured to support fracking? Um, I don't, I would say this administration is supportive of fracking, and I don't think they have any ultimatums, but I would definitely say that they uh, are encouraged to support the administration, is my sense. Thank you, Amanda Woodrum. You're welcome to add on. Yep. Okay, I think. Oh, go ahead. Nope. Go ahead. All right. Um, and I think Amanda Weinstein just summarized that that response well. Um, so, second question is: reinjection of brine water considered part of the fracking process? Um, this relates a little more to our part one of our uh, fracking webinar series where we talked about um, shale gas waste streams. I'm not sure if the Amandas um, are prepared to or able to answer this question. Um, the question is reinjection of brine water considered part of the fracking process. Um, and uh, let, so let me first um, try to field that just a little bit if, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly. Um, if we're talking about disposal of uh, the brine water that, that comes uh, back uh, to the surface, um, the produced water that comes back to the surface after um, fracking a well, um, then that would be, you know, a di the disposal of the brine water. Um, and not considered, I think, part of the fracking process. But um, do either of the Amandas want to chime in on that, a response to that um, question? I can. Sure. Uh, so it depends on you know who the speaker is and what they're talking about. In terms of the actual hydraulic fracturing process, that is just the process of injecting the water and cracking the shale. 
Um, however, in terms of, you know, when we talk about hydraulic fracturing generally and shale development generally, um, and we're talking about the economic impacts and the various impacts, um, then yes, we consider that as part of the process. Um, it's part of it, so you have to truck a ton of water in there, um, or you have to truck the water in there, and then those trucks also are used to then take the, you know, produced water back. So that's part of that economic impact. Um, and so when you talk about the impact on local areas, and that is part of that impact. Ohio has a lot of injection wells, actually a lot of Pennsylvania's uh, produced water comes to Ohio, uh, and that is part of the impact uh, for shale development. That's a good point, uh, Amanda, and I um, should recognize there, there are different ways <laughs> to look at, so that the, uh, and I was kind of taking it down to isolating the, the fracking stage, you know, um, when, when the well is, is fracked and those high pressure, um, high pressure injections are made. When we talk about the whole system and the whole process, um, that yes, that is a, a part of the, uh, the entire uh, production uh, shale gas development stage. So um, next question, if all of the costs that are being created were actually covered by the industry, any idea how expensive the gas would need to be to cover all the costs? Um, so again, if all of the costs that are being created were actually covered, how expensive would the gas need to be to cover all of those costs? Uh, my most accurate answer is I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Hi I'm higher than they are higher away. than they are now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, higher than they are now, and with natural gas prices being, yeah, so low, uh, yeah, higher than they are now is the best I can say. No, I, that, I mean, that's a really excellent question, and I think that, um, you know, ultimately, if the, the economic work on this, you know, could keep going long enough and got... Um, uh, done well enough, you know, that would be the goal, how do you, uh, to figure that out. Um, but the research, there's a lot of work to go to together. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, what, I, what Amanda number one said. Yeah, I think the answer is also it depends. So some areas may see, uh, it depends on the regulations in the area. If you have better regulations in terms of well casing and such, you're less likely to be affecting water. Um, some areas, and a lot of it is uh, risk. So there is risk inherently associated with this. You may drill and have no accidents, no spills, no casing failures, and it works out fine. You may have the exact same driller following the exact same things, and an accident happens, a spill happens, a truck tips over, uh, casing failure, that type of things, and then the cost is significantly higher. So I think it just varies, and it's some of it is just left to chance. Okay, good questions. Um, have it, another question we have that's come in through the chat box. Have you looked into the cost to ODNR to properly regulate the industry? If so, how much money do they need and where would they get uh, those dollars? Either of the Amandas? Uh, I don't know in terms of how much um, money they would need. Uh, and where they should get those dollars, you know, probably debatable. They should probably get them from uh, taxes, natural gas taxes, um, should cover that for ODNR. Um, yeah. You know. <laughs> okay. So looking at that, that, that severance tax proposal that you mentioned earlier, Amanda. Um, great, thank you. Um, has, you anyone, of, has anyone studied... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's a lot of research um, that Policy Matters has done on the severance tax, so if you are interested in that, um, you can go to our website, uh, policymattersohio.org. Great, thank you, Amanda Woodrum, for bringing that up, that um, you can find additional information, resources, literature on uh, the severance tax um, uh, concept or proposal at the Policy Matters uh, website. And um, the OEC has actually put together a, a fact sheet as well, which you can find on our website, um, just a, a kind of brief um, two-pager as well on uh, severance tax 
a proposal for natural gas or shale gas fracking specifically, and um, sort of what our outlined position is on that. Um, so we have another question here, and, and keep the questions coming um, if, if there are folks uh, that, that still have questions. Um, has anyone studied the loss of renewable energy jobs in Ohio as related to shale gas development? It's a really good question. Has anyone studied the loss of renewable energy jobs in Ohio as related to shale gas development? Uh, that's a very good question. Not to my knowledge. Uh, a lot of renewable energy jobs were um, government programs and subsidized through the government, encouraging you know the solar farm that uh, is being put in or maybe is already built, uh, encouraging wind farms. So uh, a lot of that loss, maybe if there is a loss, is also due to a change in administration. Sorry about that. Change in administration uh, and a change in policies and what they're subsidizing. So I'll add a couple of thoughts here. Um, and I don't think anybody has studied this, but I also don't think it necessarily means a loss. Um, and I'll explain my thought on that. Um, as you probably know, most of our electricity is produced with coal. Um, uh -huh, has a clean energy standard, which requires an X amount of energy to come from renewable, renewable energy. That has not changed. There's been some attacks on it, but it's unrelated to the natural gas industry. But I actually think one thing about the natural gas development is that it helps momentum um, towards diversifying our energy portfolio. Um, and uh, overall, it might actually help um, renewable energy by supporting um, greater distributed energy as opposed to uh, centralized coal plants. So I actually think that it may, may be good for renewable energy, but it's hard to say. Okay. Um, so we have another question that has come in. Uh, has anyone looked at the amount of political contributions being made by the industry here in Ohio versus how much money would have been raised if the proposed severance tax had gone through? So let me read that again. I'm um, just a longish question. Has anyone looked at the amount of political contributions being made by the industry here in Ohio versus how much money would have been raised if the proposed severance tax had gone through. Um, I'll make one quick um, response and then allow Amanda, Amanda to respond. Um, uh, there was a report I know uh, in Pennsylvania, I believe the organization is called Common Cause, uh, was a report on political contributions made by the industry. Um, and I think that they were interested in doing a similar report and study here uh, for the state of Ohio, um, but I'm not sure that they've been able to uh, to move forward on that that work given kind of limited uh, resources and, and funds. But there was interest by that organization. Um, but I can't speak uh, to really to the latter part of the question about how much money would have been. Uh, I don't have that at my fingertips, how much money would have been raised if the proposed severance tax had gone through, and maybe Amanda Weinstein or Amanda Woodrum could respond to that, that part. Um, yeah, I know what the proposed changes with natural gas, um, at least initially it would have been pretty minor. Um, it was not actually a huge raise in severance taxes by any means. Um, it probably, the proposal should have been higher than it, than it was. Um, I don't have the numbers exactly uh, with me. I will also say I don't know uh, that either that anyone has looked at how much money has gone into donations, uh, but I do know in some of our work that a lot of them are not always political donations. They create um, kind of their own think tanks and they support their own research. Uh, they had a, a similar program in Pennsylvania that was actually kind of shut down. Uh, because they found that the research they were doing was not of academic quality. 
and this is actually important, has very important political uh, implications because these studies, uh, like we saw with the impact studies, are picked up by the media and they're actually used by policymakers to support uh, no taxes, to support uh, subsidies for the industry. Uh, so I don't know of any political donations, but I do know that those things, um, that they are putting money into these type of think tank type organizations here in Ohio and in Pennsylvania, and that that does have an important uh, impact on policy. So I'll just add, um, I can't say much about political contributions either, but we, um, the governor, K uh, Governor Kasich, did come out strongly in favor of increasing the severance tax, um, and that did not happen. The oil and gas industry came out swinging. I think that um, that is one of the values of really understanding uh, both the costs and benefits of the industry, um, because by reasonably identifying some of the costs, you make the case for how do we pay to cover some of those costs um, and why we should be increasing um, the severance tax and what we sh and we know better what we should be using it for. Great. Um, thank you both. I also want to mention a couple of responses from um, attendees of the webinar. Um, it, that that last question um, promoted some dialogue here. So so I'm going to keep folks um, uh, identities anonymous, but just kind of mention some of these responses. So it was noted that yesterday Cincinnati.com published a story on contributions from industry to Ohio politicians. Um, someone also noted Common Cause, um, it's in a plane uh, dealer, so Cleveland plane dealer story last year, and then again the Cincinnati report, um, they said, uh, last week on political contributions. Um, and then we have uh, uh, a, a statistic here that's come to us. Um, Kasich uh, proposal for severance tax increase would have raised revenue of $200 million over the next two years, according to his budget pro, uh, projections. Um, and the Cincinnati.com article is titled, Fighting the Frack Tax. OK, um, so some good, some good dialogue um, there that's come in. Appreciate that, folks. Um, a, a, a separate new question that has come in, um, does anyone know how much steel goes underground in a typical well, and is it locked there forever? Um, I do not um, have those numbers or, or know specifically how much steel. Um, I know that we have one of our, our science advisors on the webinar um, as well. Um, actually, uh, Julie Weatherington Rice was a webinar speaker two weeks ago for the Shell Gas Waste Streams, and she may have, um, she may be able to chat into us um, a response to that question, and then I'll also see if either Amanda Weinstein or Amanda Woodrum know if the, um, the, the typical amount of steel that goes underground in a typical well, and is it locked there forever? Uh, I don't know the typical amount. I know they typically drill uh, about a mile down. It varies on the shale plate they're doing and the resources. Uh, so, and then they go, uh, once they go about a mile down, then they go out of ways, so however much steel that is. Uh, and I don't know if it's, uh, yes, I, uh, I'm pretty sure it stays there. Uh, so once they actually do the hydraulic fracturing, then the well uh, gets capped and it waits for a pipeline to come back in. And they actually can go back and, if they need to, go back and refract the well. So I'm assuming that they, it would not make sense for them to take all that out and put it back in. So I'm assuming that they leave that all in. Any other thoughts, Amanda Woodrum? Uh, I don't have much to add to that, but uh, it does remind me that I, I may have forgotten to make a point. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, the industry, the oil and gas industry, is, it makes a solid attempt to buy local. And, um, and some of this equipment um, that is purchased is also made in Ohio, uh, so that there's some uh, manufacturing um, and then and maybe in some cases steel that um, comes from
from Ohio, and that has additional economic implications. Okay, great, thank you. And it, it looks like um, Julie did, Julie Weatherington Rice, our scientific, OEC scientific advisor, did chime in um, with an additional response on the question about steel underground. She says, it depends on how the well is decommissioned. If the pipes are pulled, it will be recovered. Um, if it's grouted in place, it will stay down in the ground. And that's about a mile down worth of steel uh, plus a mile uh, to a mile plus horizontal uh, that, that that steel piping uh, goes. Um, good. Uh, I let's see. I think I've covered the questions. If you have more, a couple more minutes, you can send those in to the the chat box. Questions. I did have a question that I wanted to raise for both Amanda Weinstein and Amanda Woodrum, and I apologize if. You covered this um, in your presentations, one of your presentations, and I missed it. But I've heard the argument made that um, you know a frac tax, I'm going to call it, or a severance tax in the natural gas industry would be something that would deter you know industry from development uh, from developing, and, and that's kind of a big argument against uh, moving forward. You know, for for that proposal. Um, I have read and been exposed to information that, that is the contrary to that. And so I just wondered if you can speak to to what degree have uh, severance taxes on this shale gas development in other states actually deterred or not deterred industry from developing? Uh, I, would start, I would say as far as the evidence goes, it would not deter it at all. Um, if you looked at the, the slides I had comparing Ohio's taxes to Texas's to Texas's taxes, uh, Texas is much higher than we are. They started development before we did, and they're continuing development, um, even though Texas has much higher taxes than Ohio does. Uh, I would say it could detour, detour activity if there was shale throughout all of the U.S. and the industry could go anywhere they wanted. Uh, the fact is that's not the case. They can't go anywhere they want. Shale uh, plays are in specific areas, and even within those shale plays, uh, the profitability of that shale varies by location. Uh, so the industry is stuck with where the shale is. Shale happens to be in Ohio, and it happens to be in Pennsylvania. Uh, they can't, if they have high taxes, they can't decide to go to Oregon or to go to Florida because it's not there. So we're pretty lucky in terms of they can't decide where the shale is. It's already there. Uh, and even if they, you know, even if they could just compare our taxes to the main oil and gas producer producing states in the U.S., and ours are much, much lower, and they're still doing oil and gas production in areas that have higher taxes. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda Woodrum. Yeah, I think that's a pretty thorough response. Um, is, I have yet to see any evidence of a connection between activity and tax. Um, if anything, it's uh, the opposite. It's true. North Dakota has higher taxes, and they're doing a lot of development. So if you just go on evidence alone, it looks like the higher t taxes you have, the more development you'll have, if you just look at the data. Yeah. Great, thank you for clarifying that point based on your, your expert opinions. Um, wonderful. Well, I'm not seeing any additional questions coming into the chat box. I'm going to go uh, through a few kind of wrap-up points here. Um, first, uh, we'd love to have folks, um, you know, considering uh, becoming uh, members or involved with, with the OEC, um, with um, with uh, Policy Matters, you know, get involved, learn more about the work that both Amanda Woodrum are doing with Policy Matters and Amanda Weinstein, who will be going from Ohio State to Akron University this fall. Um, also for OEC, uh, you can sign up for our action alerts and our news alerts to stay in the loop on the work that we're doing on this issue and other issues in our office. Um, I want to remind you, please, please, please take a moment if you can. I, I think the survey is honestly about uh, less than, than four or five minutes um, to take um, just that brief survey. A little bit of background information um, provides us with good reporting information to some of our grantors and funders. You'll also receive a, a follow-up email um, following today's webinar with um, a recording of this webinar 
uh, the webinar materials and an opportunity again to fill out that survey link. And I just want to give a big thank you to all those folks who stayed with us um, for the duration of this webinar. We hope that you really were able to take away some important knowledge and information. I want to thank um, our speakers, Amanda uh, Weinstein and, and Amanda Woodrum, um, for, for offering your expertise today and for sharing about your research. And you've been very generous with your time. And uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope everyone has a safe and fun weekend. And uh, please join us for future OEC webinars. Thanks, folks. <laughs>